Hey folks, today is 12-24-2017, I guess, it's 6-17 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This video, I promise you, was a long time coming. I had wanted to make a video on the G for, well, it has to be over a week now. And the, th the things I have been finding have uh, held me up every time. At this point, I'm going to make this video on G. Now let everyone understand. I'm... I'm not learning from any sources out there that think to teach modern Jewish or ancient Hebrew because when I started looking at ancient Hebrew I was pulling from those sources. Unfortunately every last source that I originally was getting information from I have had to conclude thus far is not truthful, as I've said. Either a gatekeeper or simply regurgitating the information of the gatekeepers. I'm going to prove this in this video in very stark ways. You're going to see that the folks at the front of the pack who are putting out most of the information concerning what the ancient Hebrew characters, or just plain Hebrew characters, because what we have today is a mere shadow of what the writers of the Hebrew scriptures knew, understood, and used. So today is the third character known of in the Hebrew alphabet. I call it G because it first off most resembles a G and is typically used with a G sound. It has successors in many older languages, not only Phoenician and Aramaic, the Etruscan, Greek, Latin, and, of course, English. I'll go over the characters that are on my screen right now really quickly, and then we're going to jump over to uh, two videos that I think will give you a great idea of what the gatekeepers are pushing. And I, I looked a lot into this and there are uh, there are various uh, either bloggers or uh, websites that seem a little bit more independent I suppose or at least seem to be thinking more originally and there are various interpretations of this character out there um, but in general, what most people are going to find when they start searching around, if they do want to start to understand real Hebrew, they're going to run into these gatekeepers. And if not, what you'll probably do is run into maybe some folks who aren't just regurgitating what the gatekeepers are saying, but I don't know. Uh, in, in some instances, maybe maybe they're just not putting the kind of time in and uh, prayer in that it's going to take to try to figure these things out. So on the far left, under the heading, Ancient Hebrew slash proto sinaitic we have a character that really most resembles 
uh, a modern day English capital L or even the Latin L. And I'm here to tell you that the ancient Hebrew as we know it on most of the gatekeeper sites has been um, absolutely purposely stylized. This character you're looking at, do not get your characters from these folks. You have to try to find source characters. And in fact, I'm, I'm still on the search for any books that would contain um, prolific photographs of actual finds that have either painted or inked or etched original ancient Hebrew or proto sinaitic or Paleo-Hebrew characters, because that's where you want to get that from. As a matter of fact, I approached somebody who had uh, a website for quite some time, uh, supposing to teach the ancient Hebrew character that I'm friends with on Facebook. And I, I guess if you don't give this person money for their quote-unquote ministry, uh, they're just not willing to help you because I asked them about any books they might know that had these things photographed, and I got no help whatsoever. And, of course, the complaint was, I'm too poor, I'm too busy, nobody gives to my ministry. And when they say give, what they mean is money. They want money. To give the world the truth, they require money. Now, everybody needs money to live. I need money. My family needs money. Which is why I have a business. I go out to work to make money. And I rely on Yahweh, the God of Israel. And his grace towards me, his, his mercy and kindness towards me because of his Messiah. And thus, I'm able to do what I do without trying to just soak people constantly for money. All the time now, people in the truth movement presuppose that if they put a lot of time in and actually get some results, that they somehow deserve money. I still haven't made up my mind 100% about that. But the thing is... If you require money to tell people the truth, there's not a lot of truth in you. So this is what I'm talking about. Fortunately, I have this chart called the Petrovic chart, and you could find it if you did a search on Google Images. You'll get this Petrovic chart. Um, Petrovic is basically, um, he's a professor, he's, he studies old languages and he has put this chart together and he's going on the theory that the ancient Hebrew characters were derived from Egyptian characters and he has a different take on what each one of these characters means a different take than let's say the the popular um, well some stuff that you're going to see now nevertheless that does not mean that I don't think he's some sort of gatekeeper. It's, you know, it's just like Anatoly Fomenko. If he was really putting out some real truth, he would not still have his tenured professor position at Moscow U. You need to consider that. So, in these last three columns on the right hand <clears throat> what he does for every single character he shows representations of etchings inkings uh, paintings drawings that have been found and what site they've been found at and the orientation of it so you can see as I go through here what uh, the various finds, what it looked like. Okay, see them all right here. They don't maintain 
First off, this is important, they don't maintain a common orientation. That's so massively important. But they do maintain, in general, a shape or idea. So when you see this stylized G that is called Gimel, and I think wrongly called Gimel, remember something. This orientation is not fixed because if you look at the middle schematic, all of a sudden it is vertical. It is nearly upside down 180, more than 180 from what it is in the stylized version. The Phoenician Moabite, same thing. Now, the late Shemitic is actually different in the sense that it's flipped and the crooked area of it is more pronounced. Now, the modern Jewish, we're going to get to. And then how it's represented in modern English, we're going to get to. But first, a word from our gatekeepers. I'm going to start out here in about 12 seconds in to uh, Jeff Benner's uh, video on the Gimel from Ancient Hebrew Research Center. And I guess all I can say <clears throat> before I go on with these and continue to call these people gatekeepers is that I spent years of my life giving people the benefit of the doubt. And I have to tell you right now, no one. No one could do the kind of work that Benner is purported to do in developing the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible and a number of other books and, and dictionaries, lexiconic sources, and everything else that he does and completely miss the things that I'm going to bring up about the G, the so-called Gimel. The name of the third letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Gimel. The Greek name for this letter is Gamma, and the Arabic name is Jim. Notice that these do not have the L, suggesting that the original name of this letter was Gam and not Gimel. In Hebrew, the word Gam is a conjunction meaning also. Most Hebrew conjunction words were also used as nouns. For instance, off can mean moreover or knows. Ekev can mean because or heal. When we examine all of the words related to gom, we find that they are all related to the idea of gathering at a watering hole. 4,000 years ago, the letter Gam or Gimel, as it is known today, was a picture of a foot, as in walking to the watering hole. The Hebrew word Gamal is a camel, camel being a derivative out of the Hebrew word Gamal. A camel is also related to the word Gam, as it walks to the watering hole to drink large quantities of water. Okay, so that's enough of him. I'm going to disprove everything that he's saying. So now we have this guy from Shavim Panim. Okay, he does a lot of these videos too. Shavi Panim. As we said in the introduction, every letter is an archetypal form representing energies that will manifest in worlds, souls, and divinity. That sounds so Kabbalistic, doesn't it? So the idea of walking is explained in our mystic tradition. As the mystic tradition. As the idea of what's called run and return. Ratso Vishov. That all of creation is in a process of running and returning. One can experience this by putting their finger on their pulse, of putting their hand to their heart, and to be aware of their breathing. And when one studies physics, one is very, very aware of the dynamic pulsation of, of every, every 
entity, every atom, every molecule is running and returning. Wow. This is represented by the letter Gimel. The word for camel in Hebrew is Gamal. They can't prove that. Which is very close to Gimel. In the ancient world, the camel represented the idea of movement and progress, especially in the Middle East, in the deserts. That was the, the mode of transportation through the desert. Another meaning of the word gimel is gimilut chasadim, which means bestowal of goodness, doing good deeds, to give. But paradoxically, the word to wean also comes from the word gimel, the gamel. So we have, once again, a paradox that the letter represents both giving and withdrawing. And this is very, very similar to the, the dynamic of run and return. Tutti Fruity, all oh Rudy, Tutti Fruity, all oh Rudy. This is some of the most confusing garbage. Unbelievable. I, you know what? I don't know a lot about this guy. I, I don't care. I know enough to know what he's putting out. And all of this stuff that he's saying, this stuff that he's saying is so Talmudic, so mystical, wishy-washy, ucky, ugh, of the the Talmudic Jewry that is responsible for the the Nikud that surround the actual Hebrew, the the calligraphic nature that has changed those characters. I can't listen to any more. So we're going to get to what the G really is, what this character is really representing. Now, as I said <clears throat> many months ago, when I first started looking at uh, the ancient Hebrew character, and uh, most of the sources that I found were the people that I now consider as gatekeepers. And of course, all of them were calling this a foot. And so for a long time, I was kind of looking at everything in the context of this as a foot. Now, I've got to tell you, if this is a foot, then I don't know what the Middle Shemitics and Phoenician Moabites were thinking when they put it upside down and in the air like this. <laughs> no idea. Hey, maybe, maybe they believed Earth was a globe and they lived in Australia then it'd work. But seriously, you're going to find this, as I showed you on the Petrovic chart, in every possible orientation, which is the first clue that this character might not be a foot. What I, the other thing that I find is really striking, and you can't see it as much, in the modern English G here, but you, a bit. You can see it right here at the front. Our English characters, depending on the font, and then depending on the, uh, the scribe, uh, when it was still being handwritten, you'll see it in, in a, a whole number of ways. But one thing I find that's very interesting is oftentimes you will see the G in a way uh, that's very much kind of represented like this, where it seems to me that the emphasis is actually on this area right here, the, the crook, G. Now, same thing with the lowercase. And, you know, English with its uppercase and lowercase, I don't know. I think it's a bit confusing too. But oftentimes it seems like 
they were just stylized. So there's your lowercase g. There, as far as I'm concerned, this right here is a, a completely acceptable ancient Hebrew g, ga. So, you know, toss that circle on, put it on the line, and now you're teaching little kids how to make English G's. So let me get rid of that stuff if I can. And I can. Okay. So the only way that we're going to be able to determine what it is that that G really means, and we may not, I may not be able to determine what it means 100%, but I promise you I'm going to show you how those two uh, two guys you just heard from, and that this whole idea that G is a foot or something like that, that's going to be way out the window, I promise you folks. Now, as far as like, you know, rock solid definitions of these things, I don't claim that I'm doing that. You have to understand, I'm learning this alphabet too, and there's so much work that I put into it just trying to list out, you know, two character parents. Um, and what that means is just the, the very root of longer words would be like a two-character parent or a three-character parent. Um, I'm having to list so many of these in uh, different specific categories that will help me gain some understanding of these characters. And I hope that as I make these videos about these characters, <clears throat> it'll help you gain understanding. Obviously, after I make uh, an entire series, this entire series concerning the characters and the way that so much has been mistranslated and misrepresented, I'm sure later on down the road there's going to be adjustments and addendums to what I perceive right now concerning these characters. But, you know, this is a very, at this time, it is a very new and uh, publicly unexplored area of knowledge. So this is kind of the way it goes, you know. And I could either wait, who knows, uh, years to uh, try to, to get as best I can this stuff figured out and then release it in some way, book or, or web or something. Uh, <laughs> but I'm seeing the way that that's working out with all of the academics and they're either releasing bad information which shame on them um, inadvertently bad information or they're they're working for the enemy and they're releasing purposely bad information either which way bad information so there is uh, I have about I think somewhere around 30 something Two character parent roots that start with the G or the so called Gimel. Um, and I'm going to go through some of them with you and, and just show them to you. And I'm going to tell you how they are translated in King James, but that is in no way a claim of accuracy or correctness. I'm just going to tell you how what King James, and since King James is sort of the rule that almost every other English translation is pulled from, you kind of get the gist. So, um, the first one actually is, uh, it's made out of two, and I, you know what, I don't care the way that, that this G is, is put on. When, when, when I typically write it, I write it like that. Now, this word is made of two Hebrew characters. That's the G and the A. Okay, the word is Ga. And it is mostly translated as Pride. Pride. Now, we have looked at the A so far, and it certainly does look as if, go to the Petrovic chart, it certainly does look as if the A is focusing far more on what you see up here. These horns, 
than what they're supposed to be on. And we talked about horns and what horns represent. They represent an authority, a strength or a power. So if you put together that symbol, that the, the, the horns here, authority, strength or power, with this symbol here that almost everyone is trying to say is a foot. I don't know where you get pride from a foot of authority. Pride's not a good word, by the way. To have pride isn't a good thing, by the way. That word is 1341. And I'm going to punch it in real fast. There it is. Ga. And it says proud. And it's a single occurrence. And it's in Isaiah 16.6. Most of the book of Isaiah is prophecies against Israel and Judah, who both weren't doing very good at the time. He also prophesied against Mitzurim and um, Asher, a number of various people all around. And it's in context, we have heard of the pride of Moab, which, by the way, it's not pride there, folks. That's a different word. He is very, now here it is, Ga, even of his haughtiness. And is, see, pride, it's a different word again. We can, uh, we can narrow this down a little bit. It's Isaiah 16.6. 6. And this stuff is important to determine what that G is telling us. Unfortunately, Q Bible, sometimes it can take a little while to get loaded up. And uh, here we go. That's fortunate. All right. So I've clicked on Isaiah chapter 16. And we'll go to verse 6. All right. We've got this uh, Shemo. <laughs> Shimonu. All right. Shimonu, we have heard. Now, here we go. Ga'un. Mu'ab. Ga'un of the pride of Moab. Ga'un. Okay. So that would be pride again. Ga'un being 1347. So we're at 1341. And if we track forward, Ga'e to rise up, grow up, or be exalted in triumph. That's what it says. I will sing unto Yahweh, for he have triumphed gloriously. Ga'e. And then Ga'e again, proud. Cast abroad thy rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud, and abase him. Ga'e, proud. Ga'e, pride. One occurrence, Proverbs 18, 13. Fear Yahweh is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy. You see, the, the problem with pride, pride's an abstract. So we've got ga'u'al, majesty of God. Interesting, majesty of God, not pride. The tribe of Gad, ga'u'al, so it's a name. I love when they do that. Uh, something is a name, and they think to give you the literal translation of it when I, they just don't have any proof of that. All right, so we've got Ga-Ua, uh, pride, majesty, or rising up. These are all variations. I can't say enough about the uh, the variations there are um, in Hebrew two-character and three-character parent roots. There's a lot of variations. It's amazing. Uh, and to say that, uh, like, in one of my earlier videos about um, the problems with just going off of the Masoretes lexicography was like Jeff Benner at his site, the Ancient Hebrew Research Center, when he was comparing um, Masoretic texts with uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, which the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's a whole nother ball of wax in and of itself. Um, but anyways, every time that the U, I do not call it the Vav or the Wa, the U 
was gone. He would actually just write it off as just, uh, well, I mean, just a little textual variant. It's a very serious variant, folks, that ooh. And you want to know how serious a variant it is? And another reason why I don't find him or any of the others to be trustworthy? I'm going to show you why. It's because here, I'm going to give you a real simple Hebrew word real quick. Okay? That, the Y and the M, it's Yum. It's typically translated as C and sometimes as West. All right? Um, if you put another M in front of it, like this, you'd have my M, Waters. Always my M, Waters. If you put a SH in front of it, you'd have the Waters above or what's typically translated as heaven or sky, Shemaim, okay? But this right here, this yum, is sea or west. But if you take those same characters and you put this ooh right smack dab in the middle of them, now you have iyum, and that either means a day or age or period of time. I would say that that ooh is uber important, wouldn't you? So, if I select these and delete. So, with these horns of authority or power and this G together, we see that often it is pride. Now, again, I'm not seeing how a foot is relating so much to pride, since everything about pride or the fact that we saw that uh, child words from that parent root were meaning things like majesty or greatness, it doesn't seem to add up very well. Now, here's another one that you're going to find to be very interesting. I'm going to go through quite a few of these because you, ne you need to get a very broad spectrum of what's going on here with this character and how it's used. I'm going to 1354, and the word is gab. Now, it's going to say it's convex surface or back, like the back of man or mound. Okay, so that's interesting. This one it really seems to me is, is very strange. He should shave his eyebrows. It's about the only time that they try to do eyebrows here. Okay. Um, talking about a, a chariot, I guess. It says wheels, axle trees, they're knaves. Uh, knaves would be like the, um, the center uh, hub or hump. Okay. And now when we get to Job, your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay? I don't know how a foot and a bee, which they say is a tent, I'd like them to figure that one out. You show me a foot, because that's what they say. They say that, that the bee is a tent. Um, and what they're doing is they're narrowing down what we can get out of the bee. So if you put that G and B together, they're going to say, what? How does that work on bodies or the hub? Eyebrows? That's just a terrible, terrible translation. Psalm 129.3, the plowers plowed upon my back. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. And I'm going to get to things like that. That's from Ezekiel 118 where he's describing the cherub. And I think he's talking about their shoulders. That's what I think Gob is, all right? Let the cat out of the bag. I think, f for the most part, it, we're talking about shoulders here. And you're going to see, as we go on, why I would think we're talking basically about shoulders. Now, if we go to the next one here, because we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six Gabs in a row. And you can't have them all be that different. Now, on the short definition of this one being Aramaic, and Aramaic can vary from Hebrew, it's saying the definition is back or side. 
And Daniel 7, 6, After this I behold, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. I would say back is probably a little more appropriate than side, but moreover I would say that the shoulder area is more appropriate than the back in general. And we're going to see why as we go on. The next occurrence of Gab, they try to say, is a pit, trench, ditch, beam, or rafter. This is really interesting, actually. They can't honestly prove the pits or ditches. They've got one occurrence in 2 Kings 3.16, and he said, Thus said Yahweh, make this valley full of ditches. They can't prove that whatsoever. Full of ditches. Good grief. And then Jeremiah 14, 3. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to pits and found no water. Well, I'm not completely sure that that's what that means either. And we're going to get to why. Now, <clears throat> the first occurrence of Gab in this context is 1 Kings 6, 9. So he built the house and finished it and covered the house with beams. Beams. I think that one's not bad at all. The beams part. And then we have our next occurrence of Gab. They try to say is a locust. And it only has one occurrence. As running to and fro of Gab shall he run upon them. Yeah, I think that's malarkey. And then we have another Aramaic gab here. And it says a pit or a den <coughs> of lions. Sorry. And we've got um, multiple occurrences. Um, but all of these occurrences is in the sixth chapter of Daniel. Where, of course, that's the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And we have things like, O oh, king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Cast into the den of lions. Him into the den of lions. All right. So we see that. So I'm going to try to quickly encapsulate what we've seen here in this word bag. And hopefully, I'm sorry, not bag, gab. And hopefully what you'll do is, real quick, real quick, here's the B. Okay. Look at the B right here. Mighty interesting how that B changes isn't it? Or how it's represented. And somebody looking at this would know that's a bee at the time. No matter how it's oriented or the different shapes, they would know. And I believe they would know because they would know it means in, within, inside, inner. You see? You see? It's always left open. It's always left open. This one, I have no idea. If that's really a bee, wow, that's weird. That's way different. But in this, that, boy, maybe they extended the line too much, but they have the hook on there, which most of the time it would. So let's put that together with this gab. Now, I believe that what's being referred to when we see Gab, is most likely the upper back or shoulders of a man. Why? Well, I haven't completely figured out the B portion of it, I'll be honest with you, but the shoulders of a man look a lot like that. A bend or a crook. Even perhaps if we're looking at it from the side, the back and shoulders of a man. I know that's a little pronounced. That's like Quasimodo pronounced, but still. Um, and then, of course, we saw that uh, passage from 1 Kings where it says that he finished the house with cedar gab. Cedar gab. You mean like that. All right. Now, of course, we could just be looking at, I told you I haven't completely figured out the in part of this, 
but it could just basically be meaning bend in, bend within as the shoulders have, the back has, what you would finish a house with. All right, and it's going to be different than a lot of other houses that we're going to find described in the Hebrew Scriptures because many of them, it would seem, have a flat roof, obviously, because a lot of people do things on their roof. They dry stalks. Um, they do a lot of things. They bathe. So they use their roof as really an outside area above the ground to do a lot of different things. So obviously, it would be flat. So let me get rid of that. Now, we have words like gad, which is G and D, which oftentimes can be used as troop or fortune and troop. Um, and there's a lot of variations of that as well. The one I'm going to get to that I find to be the most interesting is any time one of these characters doubles up, I pay close attention. So here we've got two G's together. Those two G's together are coded as H1406. I'm going to go real quickly to H1406. One, four, zero. Six. Search. There it is. Gag. So it's two of them. What exactly could that be? It says roof, top, or house top. And everybody knows if and when you think of two feet, you're always going to think of a rooftop. Oh boy. Now, some people might say, if they look at, say, the, um, the example from Deuteronomy 22.8, when you build a new house, then you shall make a battlement for your roof. By the way, that battlement, that word, there's only one occurrence of. Um, I would have to think that basically what it means, I don't know this yet, don't quote me, probably a knee wall or a railing, Okay. But we can know that gag definitely means roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house if any man fall from thence. Now, some people might say, well, they're talking about that area of the roof that you would walk around. See, two feet walk. It means foot. Not exactly. Because we can go back a little bit and see Yahweh describing the altar of incense that went in the holy place. Now, the altar of incense, it wasn't very big. It was actually kind of small, not big at all. And he says, you shall overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof. The top. Okay, nobody walks around the altar of incense. It's too small. It's the top. And why would I think it's the top? Well, I've got reasons, and we're going to get to that that I think that it's very good. It means top. And before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof. The top. The roof. The top of the house. You can find it in many, 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 many examples. And it means top of the house or roof. And most of these you can find, obviously, are flat-roofed houses. Because I think that's actually a pretty decent design, a flat-roofed house. <laughs> Anybody who says that, you know, that there's issues with a flat-roofed house, I guess that all depends on what you want to use it for. And if it's strong and it can hold the kind of weight that you need it to hold, then no, there isn't an issue with a flat-roofed house you would have to have a slight pitch for drainage. Yes. But a slight pitch, you can still work on. Okay? So, that's what we have for, for, for the two G's put together. It's roof. That's very interesting. And then I'm going to go over some here real quick besides. You know, like um, the G and U. As soon as I can select these and delete them, pop, 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 delete. So we've got the 
the G and U that is mostly translated as back, like the back of a man or the midst of the body. I think that that's not a bad translation. I've gone over all of them. Okay, interestingly enough, the G and the Z mean to shear, like if you're shearing sheep. That's very interesting. We're going to talk about why. Now, the G and the L actually mean a heap, a wave, a billow, and it's actually even used for basin in some instances. Now, you remember how Jeff Benner tried to tell you that gam was that root of gemel, and it meant walk to the water? <clears throat> yeah. It's used as also, I think, for a very good reason, which we'll get into, of course. You also have the G appearing with the N for Gan, like Gan of Eden. Um, you have the G appearing with the P, so-called Pe, which is sometimes himself or a pawn in the Hebrew but the Aramaic has it as wing of a bird. That's very interesting too. Now the other one that I find very intriguing and revealing is that this G appears with an R and it means a stranger, an alien, or sojourner. The last two character parent that we're going to see is going to be the G with the TH, the TH, because that's not just the T sound. The just T sound, I believe, is the so-called tet. Now, here's why I don't believe that this G has got anything to do with the foot. This G-U means back or middle of the body. So you tell me what the foot has to do with the back or middle of the body, first off. Now, this G-Z... They say it meaning to like shave or to shear. I've looked at this Z a lot so far, and I know I'm working ahead a little bit, but every time I see this Z, I always kind of, I'm getting the sense of buzzing, moving back and forth. Um, the, the gaz can also mean to mow. And I think when you're bent and I don't, again, I don't have the exact meaning of the Z. But bent and sort of moving back and forth, mowing or shaving is shearing. The, the G with the L, gal, meaning a, a, a wave, heap, or a billow. Well, the gal is typically a curve, and I've seen it in a lot of things. We have it in gadol. We put a D in the middle of those, and it means actually very great. I think that the G here means bent in some way, and the L is curves, bent curves, a heap, wave, or billow. Now, they said that the gam only means also, and M can mean source or from, bending from, also. Now, we have gone, like in gan o den. Um, and I told you, if you look for Ganon with a double N, it means surround, uh, enclose. So, I don't know what N is yet. I'm sorry. But, bent N. I see N a lot with waterways. But I do also see it sometimes when we're talking about, uh, perhaps seed. Some people have uh, translated it as snake, and I don't know yet. But there is the G in the end, gan. I'm not sure what the foot would have to do with it if it was a foot. Now, G and P, gap. I told you that uh, in Hebrew, gap can be himself or upon, which I think is interesting. Or in Aramaic, the wing of a bird. Now, they try to say that the P is always pe, meaning a mouth. I don't know. Bent mouth? No, I know that the wing of a bird or foot mouth, is that what it's supposed to be? The wing of a bird is a foot mouth? That makes a whole lot of sense. But I'll tell you what, when you see a wing of a bird, what does it look like? Okay, 
For one thing, we have a wing of a bird like that, it's bent. Or if you look at the wing of a bird straight on, oh, looky, it's bent. Now, I, I will tell you one thing interesting on kind of a side note. The word for winged animals is, I'm, gonna, I'm writing it real small right here, okay? It's oop. That P appears all the time when it comes to birds. So that's interesting. Now, this is the real interesting one right here, gar. The G and the R, it means a stranger, a sojourner, a foreigner. And it's not necessarily in a, a really flattering light, okay? As, as sometimes a number of these aren't. Now, 1616, I'm going to search it. There's gar. And you can see it's used 87 times as stranger, one time as alien, one time as sojourner, uh, one time as stranger with H376, one time as stranger with H4480, one time as strangers with H582. <sighs> they give us definition sojourner, temporary inhabitant, newcomer lacking inherited rights. In, uh, or of foreigners in Israel, though conceded rights. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger. I am a stranger and sojourner with you. Exodus 2.22, And she bare him a son, and he called his name what? Ger Shem. Ger Shem. Uh, for he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. Ger Shem, stranger, 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 foreigner, foreigner, stranger. Now, why I find that to be interesting is because it's the G and the R. Now, the R, I'd have to say there's a lot of really overwhelming evidence with the R <clears throat> that it is actually the head of a man. We can see it right here. See how that's the head. But this is what we want. We want to look at this. That almost looks like a mushroom, huh? But here it definitely looks like a head. That 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 looks like something. Oh, that could be a head. Um, these ones are a little bit strange. Anyways, uh, every context that I've seen the R in so far makes me think that it's definitely something chief. Maybe head. And again, when we're talking about characters that I'm not 100% sure of, I'm going to tell you that. But I will tell you that for the most part, most of the occurrences I've seen of R tells me that it really, really seems like it's probably the head of a man. Seems like it. But you never know. We've got a lot of characters to cover between here and R, but it sure does look like the head of a man. I mean, let's just consider the English R for one second, you know? Um, and we'll try to do it simple, you know, like not stylized or whatever. Okay, look, that's the English R right there, you know? What if I... Oh, good night. It's giving me all these points. What if I put an eye and a nose and a nice big smile on him? It looks like a man. Nice short haircut. We don't want a hippie. Okay, so this is why I'm trying to say to you that I do think that there's good evidence. Now, what if it was Gar? It was a crooked man. Or let's just say one whose path is not straight because they are a sojourner. They are a foreigner. They are a traveler. You see... They don't have a straight path. They're traveling around. Abraham, right? He was a sojourner in Canaan. He was traveling around. His path wasn't straight. Now, the next one, G and TH, th, which is often called Tav, Geth. You'll remember, some of you, that there was a Philistine city called Geth. And they also um, define it as wine press. Now, if it is a wine press, again, I don't know what the th, the th is. I will tell you that one of its roots happens to be 
with the uh, with the B that we just went over, bath, um, which is the word for daughter. Think about that, daughter. Um, when um, when a lot of these words are are given, if it's in a f a feminine context, then it doesn't necessarily mean like feminine genitalia context, okay? Because in languages that are not English, especially often most classical languages, they will apply both masculine and feminine um, characteristics to a word, and it doesn't have to mean you know. Um, anything relating to the genitalia per se. Of course, I don't know that, but that's what most people say. Anyways, so if you have a word and it's uh, a descriptive of, say, a subject or noun that has a feminine, uh, a feminine connotation to it, but it's in the plural, what you're going to do is you're going to get uh, these two characters at the end to pluralize it in a feminine way. Uth, there's your there your th. It's a feminine plural. So, anyways, I wanted to throw that in because I wasn't absolutely sure, you know, um, what that th is because that's even further ahead in the alphabet, I think, than the r. It's the last character in the whole alphabet that we're going to get to. But if it is, in fact, a wine press, I find it really interesting. I've looked at wine presses. Um, you can have a, a one-man wine press that actually has either a bar or two bars at the top with this thing that goes into a weight, and it's in a barrel like this, you know, and it presses and the wine comes out, you know, all the different sides or whatever. Yeah, you can have the super old school wine presses, which actually just have a big rock, uh, sort of rock cistern with a sort of a middle thing here. And then it would have small holes out here with like little rock bowls out there. That's what they try to teach us, all the old wine presses were like. Now, um, ones that maybe are a little bit more recent that were made for like multiple people to be in, uh, would sometimes, they, it's going to have some kind of a a thing over it with maybe like little ropes that the people can hang on to while they're pressing all these, you know, all these grapes in here and then it'll have, you know, containers around it for it to come out, you know. There's a lot of different ways that you can press wine. Um, so putting those two characters together, you know, to bend something it doesn't mean it has to be foot because not every wine press is using the feet um just the fact that you're using a wine press will probably stain your clothing your hands your feet no matter if you're using your feet to press them you know your dirty old feet to press these grapes or not so that is that constitutes pretty much about all of the words that are two character parents that use the G. Now, for a while after I got over thinking that that G was a foot and it didn't take long, but for a little while after that, I started thinking that maybe the G, you know, if it was represented in this way, then it would just mean up. It would just mean up. Um. And maybe there's something to the up to that. I don't know. But I'll tell you what I do think. I really do think the part of this G that we want to concentrate on is this part right here. The bend. That's what I think we should concentrate on. Uh, rather than the direction that it's pointing. Even though does seem like all of these different characters that we see uh, besides this stylized ancient Hebrew character, it's done like that on purpose, and, and the modern Jewish, which of course is all meant to deceive. Most of the time we see kind of a crook, but up, you know, a crook. Then you think about crook, and then you think about, you know, the letter for a stranger or foreigner, you know, sometimes it's in a negative connotation, gar, crooked man, I don't know. 
their ways are a little bit crooked. I can see why even when Abraham and Moses, you know, Moses was in Midian, Abraham was in Canaanite, you know, the crooked man, because they don't have a straight path, they're wandering, they're wandering. Now, as far as the rooftop, you have two of these. So, gosh, I don't know if, you know, when you're supposed to read them, you know, is it, is it just, you know, up, up? Or is it that, just like in the top of the incense altar, you know, which probably didn't have a roof per se to it, but I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to find out more about the incense altar. I mean, was the incense altar like, kind of, not with that curve that the, psh, the, the, the program just made, but I mean, you know, did it have a top on it like that? And then the incense would go right there? I'm not sure. I'm not 100%. Um, you know, I'm really hoping to show you everything I've got, everything I can. And, and maybe you guys will do some thinking and, and see, you know, what you come up with. Now, yeah, there is another um, G, U, G, Goog. You'll find it in Ezekiel 38, 39, Goog. And you'll find it mentioned in Revelation 20, Goog, Magoog, Magoog, from Goog, Magoog. Now, when you get to the short definition of it in Strong's, it'll actually say the name of a mountain or high place. I find that very interesting. Why on earth the mountain or high place would be named after a foot? Now, um, something that really did it for me was looking around other words that just had the G in them. Okay. Um, and you have... Um, oh, I jumped the gun. Sorry. Uh, that character wasn't supposed to be there. So, uh, here. All right. Now, this is uh, the, a G, and I don't like that they curve that. I'm trying to make that, uh, that character straight because that looks actually more like a, an L or a so-called Lamed. So, let's see if they'll keep it. Those boogers, man, they keep curving in on me. Sorry about that. Maybe if I use the pencil, you know, and thicken it. Anyways, <clears throat> so we got G. This is the equivalent of E, Ger, and R. If you look up the E and the R together, you'll find out that it's, uh, they, they want to always tell you it's mountain or mount. Try just height. Try just height, air. It works very well for height, okay? And you put that G in front of it. And then all of a sudden, Gare, you find out. And this is the one place where I actually find myself agreeing. Because every gatekeeper has to be right about some things. They have to. Or, the, or people would never believe them. This is one place I'm kind of in agreement with this, uh, this guy who did now, Petrovic, that did this chart. But he wrongly, he gives the wrong strongs here, okay? It's in the 1400s. Let me see if I'm somewhere near it. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Darn it. Let's try, uh, if I can remember. I don't think it... Um, oh, I'm, I'm close. I gotta go back a little bit. I'm in the... I'm in the ooze. We got gore. Interesting. We do have gore. I haven't even looked at that. A whelp. A whelp. And again, I can't say for sure. <laughs> I can't, man. If these guys are are on with a lot of these translations, you got to remember, um, at least 20% of the lexicography is unknown. I'm going to try 14... 56. I thought it was a number that ended with 6. I, I can't remember, though. Okay, we've got... Get, eh, oh, we're close. we got to just go forward a little bit. Gare. 
1457, to bend or crouch. Why do I think that's interesting? And you can see it's got three occurrences. First King 1842, so Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. He bent or crouched himself upon the earth with his face between his knees. And I'm going to prove that, because in 2 Kings 4.34, it says, um, And he went up, he lay, it says he lay upon the child, he put his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands, and... He bent himself upon the child. I promise you that's bent, not stretched. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and bent himself upon him. Not stretched, bent himself upon him. Now, it's one of two things, folks, and I'm not going to make up your mind. I'm just telling you what I think. Could it be stretch instead of bent? Like where it says, the problem with, is the first quote. It says, he cast himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. You can't put your face between your knees and be stretched out at the same time. I don't care who you are. You'd have to remove your face from your head to do that. That's why I think it's bent and not stretchy. Bent. Now, air is a height. So you put the g with air. We'll go back here, put the ga with air. And if there's a boy laying here who's dead, all right, on a bed, and Elijah is here, and it says he put his eyes to his eyes, his mouth to his mouth, but after that, it says, now, they try to say he stretched himself over. No, I don't think so. I think Elijah is Elijah is right here, and his head to his head, he's bent over the boy. He's bent himself over, because you have to bend yourself over to put your head, say that's our head, okay, your back and your feet, head between your knees, gear. This G, I believe, means bend. Um... And the up part of it, I'm not 100% yet. I know that there's some things that make it seem like up, but there's so many more things that make it seem like bend. But I'll tell you right now, as I'm wrapping this up, because I've given you about all I can without going through absolutely every uh, parent root word that might have a G in it, which you can search around and find them for yourself. Please do. It's so rewarding. I see more evidence for bend necessarily than, than, than up, per se. But there is some evidence for the up also. And maybe it means bend upward. I don't exactly know. I think a lot of it has to do with the characters that it's appearing with. But I will tell you this. All in all, in everything I've seen about the G, that G doesn't mean foot doesn't mean foot now there's a two character word that we're probably going to get into when I go through the D which is the next character that we're going to discuss it's dag and it's the common word for fish I don't know what the D is yet, but I've got some suspicions. Now, the up part, I'm not positive about the up part. But if you consider a fish, and you consider the way that every single one of those fish swims, that it bends as it swims. You pull a fish up out of the water, and you've seen those sportsmen with their prized fishes. What is it? It's bent. So I'm afraid that is the best I have for G for now. And I hope that it has helped all of you. And as we get further along in the alphabet, 
I mean, we're going to gain more and more and more and more understandings. So probably these early characters, we're going to understand a whole lot more about them kind of later on down the road. But that's the way it goes. That is just the way it goes. And I put out my mistakes as well as everything I'm correct about. I put it all out there. I leave it all out there for people to examine, to learn from, whether it be to learn not to make those mistakes or learning what things are correct. I put it out there. I leave it out there. And I hope that it very much helps you to understand all of these things. Because we have to understand the language before we can understand everything that the Hebrew Scriptures is saying, before we can start arguing about it. So until next time, that's it. And I hope, hope the, the next one will be uh, sooner than this one took after the B. But we'll see. If it takes a lot of study, then it takes a lot of study, and that's just that. So I hope everybody takes care.